Because you listen to this show, I'm going to assume that, like me, you're a person who's fascinated by scientific and philosophical questions. So I wanted to tell you about another show I've discovered recently, the addictive, eye-opening, mind-bending podcast series, The End of the World with Josh Clark. Josh Clark is co-host of the absorbing Stuff You Should Know podcast. And for The End of the World, he dives into existential risks, ways we humans might accidentally wipe ourselves out with the same technology we're developing now in the hope that it will make a bright future for us. For example, how a haphazard physics experiment could end the universe, or why artificial intelligence could take control of the world, or how an artificially mutated virus could escape a lab and create a global pandemic. This is serious stuff for sure, but the end of the world delivers the fascinating science behind existential risks through an immersive experience with a beautiful original score and cinematic sound design that takes you from a spacecraft trying to navigate interstellar space to deep inside your body to the far future where humans have evolved into a post-biological species who live in digital form. The End of the World with Josh Clark is waiting to take you on an adventure. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Why not listen to all 10 episodes now and join the conversation on social media with hashtag EOTW Josh Clark. Welcome to Future Makers, your invitation to cutting-edge debates on our changing society with leading researchers at the University of Oxford. Our first series is all about artificial intelligence. I'm Peter Milliken, Professor of Philosophy, and thank you for joining us here in the Thomas Hobbes Room at Hartford College. Today, we're looking at whether the manipulation of public opinion through online platforms has emerged as a critical threat to public life. Around the world, automated bot accounts have enabled some government agencies and political parties to exploit online platforms on a mass scale in dispersing messages, using keywords to game algorithms, discrediting legitimate information. Through this, they can spread junk news and disinformation, exercise censorship and control, and undermine trust in the media, public institutions and science. But is this form of propaganda really new? If so, what effect is it having on society? And is the worst yet to come as AI develops? With me to discuss this are Rasmus Nielsen, Director of Oxford's Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, Vidya Narayanan, Postdoctoral Researcher in the Computational Propaganda Project at the Oxford Internet Institute, and Mimi Liotsu, also a postdoctoral researcher on the Computational Propaganda Project, researching online social influence. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Rasmus, can we start with you? Defining junk news, is there anything new here? What's AI changed from how propaganda has always been used? So I think there are two sides to this issue that face us today. One is a timeless side and one is a timely one. I think the timeless side is that we've always faced the challenge in our society is that there are powerful people who lie. There are people who peddle falsehood or misleading information for profit. And then we are passionate and imperfect beings ourselves. So sometimes we share information ourselves in good faith and with the best of intentions that in itself may be false and harmful. These are timeless problems. We've always had them. That's part and parcel of the human condition, if you will. I think the things that are timely are in large part about technology, which is that digital technologies have enabled um, the publication, uh, transmission, and distribution of all kinds of information at scale uh, and in volume and at pace that we as societies are poorly equipped to handle. So I sometimes think of uh, Einstein's observation that the nuclear bomb changed everything apart from how we thought. And I think that's a little bit where we are now with the way in which information uh, works in our societies. And of course, part of that is disinformation. Much of this is benign, uh, even if it's at a scale and a volume and a pace we've never seen before. 
but some of it is uh, manifestly harmful and malicious. And a large share is in a gray zone where we may be worried even if the senders themselves believe that they are operating in good faith. In terms of where artificial intelligence fits in, uh, I think we are only in the foothills of this. Uh, we are seeing AI being applied already, in particular to the filtering and distribution of information and the recommendation of information. We will certainly see it applied much more to the production of information in the future too. And in particular, when we see AI power tools become publicly available, either very cheaply or uh, at a retail price, if you will, even just free off the shelf for lots of different actors, we will face a whole new phase, if you will, where the ability to create information that looks as if it is captures reality, but actually is manufactured, sometimes with malicious intent, will be available at scale. That is an entirely new situation. Okay, that sounds pretty scary. We'll get onto that later. But my own perception, I have to say, is that the junk news phenomenon has grown a lot very recently. But you're saying that's not actually yet due to AI significantly. One way I try to think about this as a researcher is to think about what's an ultimate cause and what's a proximate cause. So what, what are the fundamental drivers of problems of disinformation and what are the things that enable disinformation problems? If we think about different societies that are all broadly have access to the same technologies and are broadly at the same level of technological development, I think we can see a growing volume of research that documents that different societies that are all uh, highly digital and where digital technology is widely diffused have very different levels of problems with this information. And this suggests to me that much of this is still driven primarily by players more than platforms, if you will, and by questions of the degree to which people are either receptive to or even themselves disseminators of various forms of disinformation. And what I mean by this essentially is just think about the difference, for example, between, say, the United States and the Nordic countries in Europe. These societies are highly technologically developed. They are at the top of every index of digitization and innovation in the world. But the political context is very different. The United States is an incredibly polarized political environment. It's a media market where there is money to be made, even from a very small share of attention because the market is so big. So the peddling of disinformation for profit can be attractive. And it's an environment in which if there ever was a social contract, and we can discuss what we might mean by that, it's certainly broken now. And there is no shared view of the good society for m many Americans. And this has created, an, uh, if you will, a a resonance for forms of disinformation, whether they are peddled for profit or for political gain. And if we think about the Nordic countries by society, many of the same technologies are available and widely used, including ones that are power powered by AI. But most of the evidence so far suggests that the problems of disinformation in those countries are much more contained because you have much less polarized politics, much more confined, if you will, extremist groups. You have much smaller media markets, so there's much less money to be made from peddling disinformation. And you have a greater degree of, not consensus, people who have different views on what the good life is and what the good society looks like, but at least a shared sense of how one has a conversation about the policy and the public good. That means that there is less of a resonance, if you will, for, for demonstrably false information. Right. I mean, a thought prompted by that is that maybe the big rise in fake news that we've had recently is much more connected with Brexit on this side of the Atlantic and Trump on the other side, and as you say, a, a polarisation in the political landscape, than it is to do with the technology. Vidya? If I may, yes. I think the affordances of social media intersect with existing tensions in society, which is why we see this sort of rise in the reportage of, you know, fake news. So... It is an open question whether social media platforms are merely reflections. Do they just hold up a mirror to society or do they actually facilitate some of, uh, you know, the problems that we see today? And maybe they do both, right? Um I think that would be a fair uh, statement. Yeah, and exactly that's a very difficult problem and you need a lot of data if you're trying to disentangle the effects of the media, of people's beliefs, of social trends and of the social media platforms. There are very many factors at play. So whenever someone wants to understand what is the effect of Facebook or their algorithms or of Twitter on 
misinformation spreading, on violence in certain parts of the world that are linked to misinformation online. You need to also account for the broader social environment, the broader beliefs, the economic incentives that the media might have for clickbait articles and for falsehoods and so on. So it's a very complex system of causal factors that one needs to be very careful in how to disentangle them and say, this is how much Facebook is responsible, this is how much Twitter is responsible, this is how much these types of media are responsible and so on for very many causes. That would be quite a common phenomenon, right? Something happens and you can't isolate one particular thing as causing it. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bundle of things. Mm -hmm. When Rasmus was explaining the background, I thought there was at least a ground for optimism there because if it was mainly due to the technology kind of taking off and creating an echo chamber within which all sorts of awful things happen, that might be more difficult to address than if it's due to specific polarisation I mean, presumably in history, when societies have become polarised, you've had malicious gossip spreading quickly, not as quickly or in such volume. Would that be right, Rasmus? I guess the way I think about this at the sort of the grandest level uh, is that we are living through a communication revolution of the most profound sort that I think if we can compare it to anything can only be compared to the printing revolution in early modern Europe. We are in the very early stages of this. You know, we are sort of 25 years after Gutenberg now. So we can see the technology and we can see it spread and we can already see the ripples of a disruption of many different forms of institutions and social life. But we don't really know how it's going to play out yet. We know there's going to be winners and losers. And we know, as we've known from every public discussion of every communication revolution in history, whether the printing press or later on uh, broadcast first radio and then television, that such revolutions are often accompanied by both irrational exuberance as well as sometimes unjustified deep pessimism, if you will. And normally the truth of the matter later on becomes that it's complicated, right? It's mixed and that we will not end up in any of these two extremes. I think what we are facing today, both as academics who are engaged in this discussion, but I think perhaps more importantly as societies, is that it can be really hard to suss out the difference between what part of this discussion is driven by the classical tendencies of established institutions to fear disruptive change, and what part of this discussion is about a genuine public problem that is not just a threat to established institutions and incumbents, but a threat to the very idea of a public good. I suppose that my personal interpretation of the best available evidence so far as I read it is that there are very clear problems and that there are clear examples of societies in which these problems are a genuine threat to the idea of popular government. I would say that the United States is an example uh, of how this can really imperil the idea of uh, informed public debate and collective decision making with some degree of, if you will, of of sense of of shared purpose. I would highlight India as a country in which I would be quite concerned about what's going to happen next year with the elections. But I think it's important to recognize also that there are other societies in which there are problems, but the scale and scope of those problems are not of a magnitude where I personally would be worried about the very social contrary itself. And that, I think, that difference between societies in which we should be very worried and societies where we need to recognize the problems that exist but shouldn't freak out, if you will, I think is fundamentally a question of politics and of society more than this question of technology. In the Computational Propaganda Project, we are going to study the Indian elections. And from, our, uh, from the evidence that we've gathered... Uh, During our uh, studies in Latin America, we see that misinformation or junk news seems to have migrated from some of these public platforms like Twitter and Facebook to close messaging platforms like WhatsApp. Uh, So these afford, uh, you know, greater security and a more private space for groups to interact. And the amount of misinformation, what we would even classify as hate speech that we've seen circulating in WhatsApp during Brazilian elections makes us really fear for the future of, uh, you know, some of these societies. So while we're concerned about the United States and the United Kingdom and other countries that have uh, relatively stable democracies, I think we should be aware of the scale of this problem in countries like India and even in uh, Myanmar, where uh, I think the UN has has indicted Facebook of, uh, you know, causing genocide where it's been responsible for uh, enabling 
mobilization and and creating the ground for um, ethnic cleansing of the Rohingyas. So um, I think it's also a question of, you know, how increasingly connected we are. And in countries where institutions have traditionally been very weak or suppressed by authoritarian regimes, the way in which, uh, you know, the people interact with these platforms is very different from the way in which, uh, you know, other people interact with, say, Facebook or Twitter and so on. Could you say a bit more on that, the differences? Right. So I think particularly in Myanmar, there hasn't been, so perhaps Rasmus could speak to this a little bit more. I don't think in the past that they've had a very vibrant media landscape. And when the country first began opening up to this sort of digital era, Facebook stepped in and there were telecommunication companies that offered them data plans through which they could access Facebook for, uh, you know, free or at very low cost. And Facebook, in effect, became the de facto internet. So, uh, so vast sections of the population didn't have access to a diverse range of news sources. And they began to, I think there is evidence to show that they view the world through the lens of Facebook. And that has had a very disruptive effect on society. And is that partly because through Facebook, they tend to spend lots of time communicating with people who have similar views to their own and lose sight of others? That could be one of the problems. I think in the case of Myanmar, there was a rumour that was started about a Muslim tea owner, tea shop owner. And uh, I think there was a Facebook group that formed around this. And this this video or image was quickly spread within this group and then spread more widely. And uh, this, this resulted in, uh, you know, uh, turning the tide of popular opinion against uh, the Rohingya Muslims. So there have always been tensions in the country between the Buddhist majority and other minority groups. But I think some of these, uh, you know, Facebook in particular has been an instrument to maybe, uh, you know, exasperate these, these tensions. Like we said before, it is exactly a mix of different causes and it does depend on the kind of society and the kind of institutions that are present in a given country, in a given society, the kinds of uh, media literacy levels that exist and so on. So exactly, it might be that in a society like perhaps uh, Myanmar's, things can spread online in such a way that people actually believe falsehoods or conspiracy theories and so on and go on and act on it. So, yeah, it is something to to be studied further in order to try and get a grasp of what should platforms do when they operate in such countries, what should societies do, what kind of education initiatives perhaps should exist for people to be more cautious and exercise more agency in terms of when they see something online, should they believe it, should they try and fact check it, what tools should they use to kind of... What sort of research would you do to investigate that? Because, I mean, for example, to investigate the effects of education, that's going to be quite a big job. You've got to actually implement the changes in order to see what effect they have, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So my PhD work was actually on causal methods for understanding the influence of online communications on outcomes. And it's very hard because when... In reality, there are usually very many causes that interact with each other as well that you need to try and disentangle. So it's a very hard problem and that other academics have also acknowledged this. Um, so I think... First of all, before we make any claims that it's this platform's fault or it's this specific people's fault and no one else's, we need to acknowledge that, hang on, there are many possible causes that might be involved. They might have different importance in their role. So what you would need would be enough data, like perhaps, like you said, an intervention in like an education policy and perhaps doing a random control trial with some people. You give them this new education, some people you don't, and you see how their attitudes change towards consuming media and consuming maybe false media from online or not. So the, it's not an easy problem, and there are um, certain difficulties in how to address it, but there are ideas that have been proposed in terms of education, in terms of platform policy and so on, that are worth starting to try and measure what might an effective solution be. And of course, ideally, one would benefit from getting data from the platforms themselves, like Facebook and Twitter, actually getting detailed data on 
what news do people consume in those in a given context so that we can actually have some transparency in terms of collecting slowly the pieces of this puzzle of news consumption, of social trends and so on, and trying to see how do they all play out and lead to the outcomes we observe in, in, the, in the world. Might it be, whether that be violent outcomes, people believing falsehoods and so on. I think we are phasing here as sort of a classic discussion in some ways and how we think about the role of communication in our societies and particular communication technologies, where every time we live through one of these big communication revolutions, we get the same sort of tropes at play. The printing press leads to Protestantism. The radio leads to fascism. Social media leads to populism. And the, the underlying way of thinking about causality or the influence of communication uh, on the attitudes and behaviors of, of individual citizens is what media researchers call sort of a hyperdemic needle, right? So there is a message and you just sort of inject it into people's brains and then they have that idea and that's how they act. And then sort of nitpicky media researchers come along and say, well, you know, actually it's not that simple and media effects are very real and very important, but they are generally highly conditional. They are generally countervailing. So there will be different competing messages. They're often short term. They often primarily manifest themselves if uh, people are exposed to very one-sided messaging on only one side uh, of, of a political issue, for example. And often they take other forms entirely than changes in public opinion and attitudes and behavior. They might be more institutional. So for example, the rise of the printing press may in fact disrupt the Catholic Church as an institution, even if it doesn't lead to Protestant beliefs, if you will. And the rise of social media may in fact disrupt the political party as an organizational structure or the newspaper as an organizational structure even if it doesn't actually lead specifically to populism or other particular political beliefs. So I think we're having a discussion here about sometimes an optimism, the, the belief, if you will, that technology not only can but will transform society. Sometimes we think of this in positive terms. I think in this moment in the Western world, we tend to think of this in a slightly more pessimistic set of terms, perhaps in part because of political outcomes in recent years that have been both surprising and often disappointing for a certain class of society that then in turn are looking for explanations. You know, why are we seeing the election of Donald Trump? Why are we seeing Brexit? For people who are not in favor of these particular political outcomes, it might be tempting to attribute them to technology rather than ask the question, well, might the political options that I would have preferred perhaps be unappealing to many people? Might we perhaps live in society in which there are needs that are not met, whether those needs are cultural or economic or others, that others appeal to more effectively than those that I have sympathy for? And there it's very convenient and I think tempting sometimes to blame technology for that. In particular, I think it's worth remembering in discussions around the way in which disinformation, which again, I want to stress, I think is a real issue and a, and a, and a significant challenge for our societies, but perhaps not always of the scale and scope that is asserted in public debate, is that I like to ask people who are very bearish on this issue is, when is the last time you were the one who were suckered by this? And what makes you so sure that so many others are suckered? And this is a not just a sort of, a, if you will, a rhetorical move on my side. This is a well-established finding in media research. It's called the third person effect, which is the idea that if you ask people to assess the question of whether media and communications affect in society, advertising, political communication, news or the rest, that people would generally say, well, it doesn't influence me, but it influences all these sad suckers out there, right? And I think we have a little bit of that going on in this discussion around disinformation. I meet very few people who think that they themselves have been duped by any of this, even if they've often come across examples of it. But lots of people seem to be absolutely certain that lots of people they disagree with have somehow been brainwashed. Right. Gosh. Presumably you're not going to say that there is no fact of the matter. I mean, that it's all a matter of opinion and one person's view is just as good as another's. No, absolutely not. I mean, I think there are issues in which we can usefully think in terms of true and false. And I think that the idea of the best obtainable version of the truth has a real and important role to play in politics and public life. And I think it's clear that we are at a moment now where that role is under pressure in many societies. And I'm also open to the idea that digital technology may have exacerbated the pressure on that idea, though I suppose I tend to believe that in societies in which top politicians are directly disputing scientific consensus on major issues of our time, like climate change uh, and the like, there might be more pressing problems than the question of whether uh, social media may enable the sharing of information if, in fact, say, presidents 
just to use an example, are aggressively combating uh, what we might consider to be a scientific truth. People may differ quite a lot in terms of how critical they are about sources of information. So some people may be happy to form opinion on a relatively small amount of data and just extrapolate and assume that it's true widely. Other people may be more circumspect and think, oh no, I need to gather quite a lot more information before I make a judgment. Now, is there not a risk with social media that because of the echo effect, that a story which was originally, as it were, just one instance, becomes repeated and repeated and discussed, and is therefore seen to have far more influence psychologically than it otherwise would. Now, those are going to affect the less circumspect people far more than the ones who are more critically minded. I want to be absolutely clear. I think there are disinformation problems in our societies, and I do think that they are in part facilitated by digital technologies, in particular those that are developed by for-profit platform companies. And I believe very strongly that these companies have a social responsibility to help combat these problems, and it's in their long-term commercial self-interest to do so, because in the absence of doing that, uh, they will face intervention. Uh, right for Could you just clarify, for profit, are you suggesting that it's the profit motive that's leading them to allow this to happen? No, no, not necessarily. Uh, I think we need to face the fact that much of the infrastructure for free expression is currently owned and operated by private companies who have, as uh, their primary consideration, serving their shareholders. I don't believe that the bulk of the disinformation problems we face today are driven by the profit motive of these companies because many of them are very profitable, dominant players in sectors where if they were rational, they were playing for the long game rather than maximizing from quarter to quarter by a few more clicks and some spurious piece of information, they should be far more concerned about politician coming in and messing up their business model. So I don't think that... And the four perhaps reputation as well? Yeah, I mean, if users lose trust in them, then it's game over if a competitor emerges. This is more to, to preface a direct response to your question, if you will, because I don't want that response to sound like I'm trying to suggest that the platform companies are off the hook or that digital technology doesn't matter or that we don't have a problem. It's that I think it's really important that if we as societies want to respond effectively to the problems that we have, that we accurately understand the causes and drivers of them and that we don't mischaracterize them in a way that might lead to interventions that would be counterproductive and perhaps even harmful in unintended ways in other areas. And what I mean by that is simply that to say that while it's clear that digital technologies are part and parcel of problems we have with disinformation, it's really, really important to remember that much of what we see of disinformation on platform companies and, um, and, and using digital media are essentially using the, in, the completely the same affordances as entirely legitimate and far more commonplace uses of the same tools. These are two phases of the same coin. These are general purpose technologies that are used in a wide variety of different ways. And if we discuss the problem of disinformation in isolation, we risk losing sight of the fact that the very same technologies are also demonstrably creating a lot of value in other ways. So for example, on the issue of the ways in which people come across news today, it's true as you suggest that people have different appetites for news and factual information, different ways of thinking about their own relationship with public life. And those who are most interested in collecting information to form their views, will seek out information of their own volition. But this is a minority of the population. And we know from a growing body of research, when you think about the majority of the population who are less interested in public affairs and less likely to directly seek out information about public affairs, search engines and social media demonstrably play a significant and positive effect in exposing these people to more news than they would seek out of their own volition. Now, the reason this is important is that in contrast to the fear of filter bubbles. In fact, research finds again and again that social media and search, in fact, diversifies people's information exposure. And if we were to intervene in the digital media environment with the best of intentions, thinking that they did the opposite, we would get it wrong and we would hurt public debate. Many people will think that's extremely surprising because the, the idea of social media just echoing back biased views within a small group is, is very familiar. Is the evidence for this, for what you say, very solid? I think this discussion sometimes risks confusing two different things. One is the question of whether there are echo chambers in the world, whether there are people who live their lives in largely self-enclosed and insular information environments. The answer to this question is demonstrably and conclusively yes, even though they are in many societies relatively small minorities, they are there and they can be very important. 
The second question is why is this so? Of which there are sort of two key considerations. One is the question of whether filter bubbles, that is algorithmically filtered environments, lead people to more attitude consistent information. Or secondly, self-selection, whether people in fact seek out attitude consistent information. And there I would say the preponderance of the, 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 on the balance of the evidence is in favor of self-selection and that filter bubbles, um, while an important hypothesis and a real risk, in fact are very rare and that social media and search engines drive people to more diverse information than they would seek out themselves. Like you said, it's really important to understand the different causes because that's going to inform what policy platform or the government or someone else adopts in terms of what should we intervene on to make this better. If you don't understand this correctly and you intervene on the wrong thing, so you try to fix a cause that you think is more important than it actually is, you might get the opposite effect, you might get no effect, so you've wasted resources. Further to his point about the good role of uh, social media platforms, that is also something to look at because social media platforms are used for many different settings, they're used in many different ways, so it is important when someone tries to make the claim that, oh, social media platforms are all bad, to also look for other contexts and whether in some other contexts like information seeking or keeping in touch with your friends or discovering new events or something that are actually positive for someone's life. There was, for example, a recent study that goes, goes perhaps contrary to other studies that uh, assume that or that find that echo chambers online are bad. So an echo chamber is a phenomenon whereby people online tend to see opinions that agree with theirs. It's not exactly the same as a filter bubble, which is created by the algorithm's filtering function. It probably has more to do with the fact that people select who they follow and they tend to follow people who agree with them. And there was a recent study by uh, Chris Bale from the US and his team where they found that echo chambers actually reduce polarization, particularly amongst Republicans, less so amongst Democrats. So they did a controlled experiment where they recruited people, they had the treatment and a control group, and the treatment group were people who agreed uh, to follow a Twitter bot that the team created, and that bot retweeted tweets from um, leading uh, Democrats and those were shown to Republican people who participate in the study and vice versa, tweets from Republicans were shown through the bot to Democrats. And it was found that people who actually uh, were exposed to these tweets from the opposite end of the political spectrum actually became more polarized. So these are phenomena where we don't exactly yet have one answer about how they work no. We don't always find the same conclusions. And, and a lot of questions arise there, don't they? I mean, one might naturally think that the reason why they're becoming more polarised is because they are interpreting the tweets from the opposition as lies. So, in fact, it's the polarisation mm -hmm. feeding on itself. Because exactly. if, if I think the other guy's lying, then the more he says, the more I'm going to dislike him for lying more. Exactly. If a priori you think whatever they say is wrong, then you get more and more entrenched in what you believed already. Right, OK, but uh, Vidya? It's important that while we put pressure on social media companies to accept their social responsibility and that there is evidence to show that they have facilitated the spread of misinformation, it's important not to scapegoat them for all the problems, all the social problems and polarisation we see in society today. And it shouldn't be an easy option for us not to introspect or reflect upon what might have, what might be the underlying causes for the divisions that we see in society, whether they're financial divisions or because of education or, uh, you know, these are more fundamental problems that we should, we should continue to reflect on while we, while we understand the role that technology plays in perhaps uh, deepening some of these fault lines. Yes, and, and presumably not only deepening, but it could be that social media do raise some problems to a level where they, they simply wouldn't exist without them. You could have a situation where there's some kind of problem, a disagreement or a disruption between different groups, and left to itself it would simply subside in the natural course of things. But if it rumbles on and on and on and there's, the hostility grows and grows instead of subsiding, right? So it, it, it is possible, isn't it, that you could get serious problems in a world with social media where you'd have had no visible problem at all without it? There is that danger. And, uh, you know, I did speak about Myanmar where precisely that's what has happened. But uh, it is important to keep in sight, you know, the fact that there are disparities in society that we as responsible citizens have to address. While we understand, you know, the role that 
technology plays in shaping some of these issues. So I think it's we're, we're struggling to achieve the sort of right balance between being optimistic about technology, and this is the tension that uh, Rasmus spoke about. It's a classic problem because some people say that we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution and AI steps out of uh, science fiction to become a reality of our everyday life. So I think we are struggling as a society to come to terms with that radical shift. And it's natural that we would uh, we would examine very closely some of these uh, platforms that has contributed to this. You talk about recognising underlying inequalities and so forth in society. Presumably, with regard to understanding those, and we're not talking here so much about the understanding of researchers, but the understanding of ordinary people, that there are these things. Is it not possible that social media and so on could become part of the solution? I think that is the hope, that they would evolve into better versions of themselves. So I think they started out to democratise access to information, which is which is hugely important. So in a society like India, I think, uh, you know, which, which represents Facebook's biggest market now, there are several people, maybe homemakers, maybe women, who have a platform to express their views now that they are users of Facebook that they didn't have before. And this can often be an empowering experience. The more people you can get talking to each other, the hope is that ultimately we would find some kind of consensus. But is that actually very plausible? I'm, I'm just thinking that if what you want to do is to make different parts of society more understanding of each other, typically that means they need to think more deeply, not less. If you've got more and more contributions going in from lots and lots of different people, that actually pushes you more towards rather superficial attention to lots of messages, doesn't it, rather than engagement with some source of information that might give you more enlightenment. I'm, I'm wondering, is there any way we can tilt the evolutionary landscape so that these uh, tools are encouraged to move in a more useful direction from the point of view of public information and understanding. I think this is one of the defining questions of our time. Uh, and it's a question that I know is asked very urgently within the technology companies themselves, but even more urgently, of course, is a question that all of us as members of the public need to consider and consider what we think the right response is to. And I think one way to break it down is to say, that the choice now, leave aside the question of how one would pursue the choice, but fundamentally the choice now is whether we seek to agree or whether we seek to agree on how we discuss things. The first is the idea that we think we know what the good society looks like, and then we try to engineer institutions that arrive at that outcome. And the other one is an approach where we believe that we live in irreducibly diverse societies, and what's important is not that we define exactly what the good society looks like, but that we have a structured way in which we can handle our disagreements. And these are two very different ways of thinking about the future role of digital technology. Is it the role of companies like Google and Facebook to pursue positive defined ends in society, that we agree on things, that we all get along, that we're nice to each other, that we're consensual on certain views? Or is it their social role to enable us to in an informed and structured and peaceful way discuss our disagreements amongst ourselves. Personally, I tend to hold the second view, in particular in light of the fact that these companies operate at scale that is almost unimaginable across 190 plus countries in the world in which people have legitimately different views on all sorts of matters, the role of religion in public life, how you decide who gets what, when and where, how we live together, who belongs to the policy and so on and so forth. And the idea that Facebook or Google should come in from the outside and say, you guys must be nice to each other you can't be angry with each other. You have to get along. This is trusted information. This is the truth. To me, it sounds like an imposition, though I know that there are people who would like these companies to play that kind of role. Right. But there are two very different things that you focused on then. One was to do with, if you like, broadly political questions, place of religion, inequalities, who gets what for what and so forth. And the other is to do with, if you like, how discussion takes place. Should it be polite? Should, should it be well informed? And so forth. Now, one might legitimately think that on the second series of issues, there is a right answer that if it were possible 
to force it or to encourage it, that would be a good thing. Is there any serious question that well-informed opinions are better than opinions that are just made on the basis of a tweet? I think it depends uh, an awful lot on who gets to decide what constitutes a well-informed uh, opinion, uh, and I don't, I can't think off the top of my head of a society in which that judgment can be made in a way that wouldn't very quickly carry with it many explicit or implicit biases in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of religion. So the idea that there is some outside point from which one can judge the veracity of public debate in its totality is one that fills me with dread. There are societies that believe that this is so, um, and they are implementing regulation of digital media companies on that base. Uh, there are, for example, mainland China um, and, and others. It's not something that I personally think one should see as a positive model necessarily. No, but could I again distinguish? It's one thing to say such and such is a reliable source of information and the other one isn't, so don't trust them. I wasn't talking about that. When I'm thinking of a well-informed opinion, it's entirely possible for two well-informed people to differ hugely about what the truth is. But it's a matter of taking account of more information, seeking it out, valuing good argument over bad argument, and so forth. That's entirely compatible with big disagreement about both premises and conclusions, isn't it? I'm not against informed opinion, to be clear, and I don't mind deliberation. What I would say is that the skills that we associate with informed opinions and deliberations are unequally distributed in society. Sure. And if we premise political participation on having those skills without rectifying that inequality in advance, right. we are severely restricting popular government. And if we... Um, but then you're, ta you're talking here about privileging the people who've got these skills. I'm thinking more about encouraging those who don't have these skills to acquire them. In other words, pressuring those who are expressing their views to actually form them on better evidence, uh, to look at more sources of information, uh, to be more cautious about what they say, to think more rather than just tweeting an instant opinion, that sort of thing. I mean, can you see that as harmful? I think the idea of an informed citizen is a powerful one and a positive one. But if we impose it as a universal standard, I think realistically, given uh, what we know about who we are as a species and how societies work, we are going to move towards a more exclusive form uh, of public debate and popular government. And that doesn't mean that being informed is not a good thing. It is. Um, but if we make that a requirement in some form for taking part in the political process, that would make me personally very uneasy. Um, yeah, I agree. All of this is, is sensible. Going back to what is the responsibility of the social media platforms and what should they do? Um, and should they kind of indicate that this is a good quality source, this is a bad one? Some initiatives like that have started with Facebook partnering with fact checkers, for example. And for, for a while, they did show kind of a note next to an art any article that was posted on the timeline that um, this is this kind of source and see some more information about what this source is about. Um, so that might be useful it still remains to to be seen and it also depends in what way they deploy that and if they show that to everyone who's on Facebook so how that's going to work but i think another thing that's important is for people to not necessarily go on social media to get their news and that goes to the idea of an informed citizen but perhaps to go straight to the news agencies that they feel are trustworthy and that and go read the news there. So to an extent, I would think that social media platforms are perhaps better for keeping you in touch with friends, for entertainment and so on, but perhaps their main goal or their strongest role isn't to inform you because there exists a, th a thing called the open web where you can go to websites and actually get your news there. You can also go look at Wikipedia. So there are other sources beyond social media platforms for people to be informed from. Yeah, so perhaps there's something else to be considered in terms of what can people do to to address any misinformation that they see on social media. Um, but and it's a different yeah. question, right? Mm. How the, the people who are misinformed are going mm -hmm. to address it or how we might wish that they would address it. I mean, if they are actually getting their news or exactly. pseudo news from WhatsApp, and what do is... we do? I mean, do, is, there a, is there some prescription that any of you would suggest? No, exactly. That's mm. that, that was the word I was going to use. I mean, the idea of an informed citizen is very powerful, but I think we should prevent it from being either prescriptive or patronizing in some way, because, that, because in countries like India, 
there is a criticism, a valid criticism, that, uh, you know, narratives around society have been controlled, traditionally controlled by a small group of elites, and that, uh, you know, internet opening up of society has contributed to society at large being exposed to different viewpoints. I think we have to reflect more deeply on the idea of an informed citizen because it's linked very closely with access to information, access to education, which, again, in a society like India is not equitable or in many other societies as well, in many other countries, not not everybody has equitable access to information or even to, you know, education. So who gets to decide, you know, what is, what is, who who is an informed citizen? Is it from your personal experience that you become an informed citizen or is it from, you know, attending a liberal arts college. I mean, I isn't there a risk here, though, that we're privileging the idea of fairness and equality amongst people over actual truth? We've spent a lot of time learning about medicine, for example, learning about climate. If you said, well, we mustn't privilege the views of the elite who've studied medicine and done research and all the rest and all these controlled trials, and you, you do controlled tr- trials, right? Why should you have any more authority than somebody who's been told by a relative that such and such is a good way of healing some disease? Well, we know the answer, don't we? That these methods have led to great knowledge and great benefit. Right. I mean, while conceding your point, I think it's important to recognise that we have an open mind while discussing maybe alternate views, even about, you know, accepted truth and so on. Because I believe that... uh, you know, this has led to a lot of polarization in society because we seem to be impatient with others who don't share our opinions. I mean, I'm in no way suggesting that we don't give respect to, you know, established scientific truths. Far from it. But, I mean, I think it's important not accept that there could be an alternate point of view which could be expressed on social media. Well, I'm going to give an alternate point of view here, because I would suggest that a lot of the polarisation we see, we've seen a lot of debate about MMR and climate change, and this has been really harmful. People have stopped getting their children vaccinated, and some have died as a result. Uh, Who knows where all the stuff about global warming will go? But this seems to have come about precisely because too much respect is being given to ill-informed opinions and expert opinions, genuine expert opinions, are being treated as though they're just one opinion amongst others. I mean, I would just say in response to that, I think all of us around this table, and this is unsurprising given what we do and where we work, believe very powerfully that science is one of the central institutions for the improvement of the human condition. But I think it's also really important to keep in mind that being informed does not give you authority in itself. Authority is not an attribute that you acquire on your own. It's a relation that you have with someone else. And uh, I think we're living in societies now where those relations are fraying, in part because they're being actively challenged by self-interested actors that believe that they can benefit from undermining the authority of science. Uh, But also perhaps sometimes, and I wouldn't say that this is the prime factor in it, but sometimes perhaps also because science has not always been a very good advocate for itself and has relied on other institutions for uh, creating the connective web with wider society. And in the world in which news organizations have to cut down their workforce and are laying off science reporters and specialist reporters, in a world in which the uh, marketplace of opinion is increasingly dominated by self-interested think tanks, by so-called thought leaders from private enterprise and the like, and a world in which many scientists, for entirely understandable individual reasons, are retreating to specialization and a very technical vocabulary that is very hard to understand, uh, even for well-educated and informed outsiders, and have no incentive to engage in public debate. The problem with the authority of science may not be whether it's informed, but that it is under attack and that it has been very bad at engaging in the discussion around its own purpose. And I'm very glad to see that I think we are seeing a response to this from scientists who are understanding that to be a scientist is about science, but it's also about the public role of science and the way in which science argues for its own value in society. 
and that to be active in that is part and parcel of what it means to be a scientist in the 21st century. So one might say it's become necessary, but it's become necessary because of a problem. People go into science and get advanced in science because they're good in science. You wouldn't, if you restricted that to people who are good at public relations and debating, uh, you're going to be cutting out most of the most promising scientists, I imagine. Now, obviously, the authority of science has been challenged. A lot of the challenge, I would suggest, has come from, for example, postmodern lines of thought. And one could argue that that's been unambiguously harmful. It's undermined the reputation of science. And mostly, that's not been deserved. I mean, obviously, there are egregious cases you know, of, of scientific fraud and so forth. But a lot of what science is having to defend itself against is stuff that I suggest to you, it would have been better that it never, never had to defend itself against. I mean, I broadly agree with that. But nonetheless, here we are and we have to defend ourselves. Uh, is that the situation we wish to find ourselves in? No. But is it the situation we find ourselves in? Yes. Can we rely on others coming to our aids, perhaps up to a point? Can we do so entirely? No. Did we pick this battle? No. Did we wish it? No. But does someone need to fight it? Yes. No one can do everything all the time. I'm not asking uh, or suggesting that every scientist should do a second shift of working very hard to engage with the public, with journalists, with policymakers on top of the work that she's doing in the laboratory or in, in leading uh, scientific inquiry. But I think that science as an institution and the organizations that enable independent inquiry like universities have to think very seriously about communication, public outreach and engagement. And if we don't do that, and if we don't take the time and the effort as institutions to invest in that, we have to ask ourselves, is that good enough when we see our authority being challenged? But of course, around this table, we're all very much in favour of public engagement. And that's precisely what uh, these podcasts are about. But yes, I, I do take your point fully. What I'd like to do now is just move on and ask about the future and where you see things going. We've been talking about the problems as they are now and to some extent about ways of ameliorating them. But we have reason to worry, Rasmus, when you were introducing the topic you were talking about, artificial intelligence here has a long way to go. It could be that the worst is yet to come. How do you see this going? Part of my research is about um, investigating what are known as generative methods, artificial intelligence techniques that use neural networks to generate new data out of existing data sets. And they've already been used successfully to generate images from an existing data set, to color in images, to modify videos, and so on. Images have had the power to manipulate, to, to form your belief system. So you, you're programmed to believe what you see. Is this technology set to change that? So that's one example of how AI could make things worse. It certainly worse. is, yes. Are, are there other examples that come to mind? There are similar cases where AI is getting much better at imitating how humans talk and how they write online. So I think there were some cases where scientists found that they could really imitate Yelp reviews. So then they would upload fake machine generated with AI uh, reviews of products and uh, people would actually read them online and they would believe them that it was an actual person who had a really bad experience with the product. So then you can really damage the reputation of something by posting many, many of such fake reviews online. And that's the thing with AI because it can generate very many of them at scale, at very low cost. So it's, it makes, it's a tool that makes this kind of forgery much easier now. So that's another case of potential harm. So might it be that if this technology becomes very widely available, in a sense, that could provide its own solution? Because if it becomes very widely available, everyone will know about it, right? They'll even be able to experiment with it themselves. They'll get more critical. I see what you mean. I think that's a dangerous way to think of a solution. Skepticism is a good thing and uh, literacy is a good thing. And it's good that more people are aware of how technology enables the editing, even manipulation or wholesale creation of seemingly truthful information. The problem with thinking primarily about skepticism, I think, is the question of how we think about collective decision making in a world of skeptics, where I think we know that democratic societies rely in part on skepticism, but also on affirmation, that we also have to make a decision about what is good enough, what is true enough, what do I agree enough with that I will sign up and support it. And if we only move towards a world in which people become 
ever more informed about all the different ways in which people could try to meddle with them and manipulate them and hoodwink them if they're not also equipped to think about, well, you know, given the range of options available, where might I think find things that are more credible, more trustworthy, more likely to be in my genuine own interest? Then we're moving in a, in a sort of towards a paralyzed society, I would say. So I think here we're, we're really, I think, in some ways of a classic arms race between ways of using these technologies that are paralyzing and destructive for society as a whole, even if they are instrumentally useful for individual actors, and then ways uh, of combating such systemic abuse. And essentially, it's a spam problem, to use a, a way of thinking about this from digital technology, from the early days of digital technology. And there are some of these problems at scale that, uh, as Vijay and Mimi has rightly said, are right now evolving in a very problematic direction where for the end user, it's very difficult to detect manipulation and fakes. But I would say that we are seeing in parallel with that a development of technologies that aim to identify such manipulation, whether that is by patterns of behaviors, whether that is about individual actors with a history of engaging in manipulation, or whether it is, in fact, about manipulation in the individual instance of communication. So things like, say, the pixel density of edited video will be different depending on what the source images are or the density between something that's shot on location and something that's created wholesale. These are things that can be detected technically, and we are seeing examples of this. For example, AFP, the French news agency, has developed a browser plugin that is not so much directed towards the main, the, 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 the public at large, though people can use it if they want to, but it is developed to help journalists uh, detect manipulation or editing in social media material that they may want to use in their news coverage. And this has found, for example, a manipulation in video footage that purported to be from the Catalan referendum on independence is detected much manipulation material coming out of the Ukraine, whether of images uh, or video or other things that purported to document certain things on the ground, but were in fact manipulated. And these are, are by now detectable in large part due to the popularization, normalization of the, some of the same AI technologies that are also enabling the people that are trying to... Uh... But as you say, this is going to be an arms race, right? Because once you've got technology that can detect these things, somebody's going to develop technology which will design fakes that evade detection. Researchers are not developing this technology for that purpose, for eroding public trust in what they see. So it's all about making these machines smarter and more human-like to learn from from what they have experienced and so on. And there are so, perfectly legitimate reasons exactly. for having fake scenes, right? Exactly. If, you, if, you're, right if you're producing a film <laughs> and you want to be able to create scenes. Right. So, for instance, this is one of the ways in which you can generate new data out of existing data sets. So it is a powerful technique, but... You know, we also have to be aware of some of the harm, unintended consequences. The researchers may not be doing it with the harmful uses in mind. Exactly. Am I wrong in thinking that if methods of detecting this are produced, then somebody, maybe not a mainline researcher, but somebody else is going to find a way of getting around that detection? Rasmus was talking about detecting modified images. Yeah. So which means you have a source image that you can input into this system and it could detect whether it's been tampered with, if something has changed, for instance, pixel density and so on. But these generated images don't have a source image. It could be that the statistics of the pixels and so on are systematically different, right, from a normal image, I, I would imagine. But uh, I'm just thinking that if that's so, as soon as somebody discovers that, that that is a systematic thing, they can easily put in an algorithm that avoids that problem. By definition, these images are not detectable as fakes because they're yeah. not fake images. But you're right. I mean, we might have the technology in the future. That's why our work is so important that we, we're here to identify these problems and maybe you know, think around some of these issues and uh, while acknowledging that they can do good, also recognize what some of the other consequences might be. Let me say, I think one way to think about this question of artificial intelligence and how we move forward around problems of disinformation is to recognize, well, there is a clearly an ethical dimension of this, and that's important. There's also a political dimension to this that I think is equally important and not always as recognized or as publicly discussed. And what I mean by that is essentially is to say that 
I think it's critically important and there is a definitely an awareness of this amongst AI researchers, whether in universities or in the private sector, that it's critically important to ask the question, what will this technology be used for? And to ask the follow-up question, what will it be used for in the connection with vulnerable minorities who are not my uh, classic use case or the white male guy that I design for uh, much of the time? So who might be particularly vulnerable to this technology and how it's going to be used? And how might it be app used? And I think we are seeing this increasingly. We can always want more ethics, but we are seeing, I think, an ethical discussion. I think what's perhaps slightly less happening is a political discussion of how we make sure that on the balance and on the whole, these technologies serve the public good and enable a wide variety of different uh, definitions of the good life, but broadly uh, are not destructive for our societies. And I think in some ways we can think of this as analogous to pollution, if you will, uh, if you will, a form of information pollution. Now, I realize we're not always going to agree on what exactly this information is, so in that sense it's different from pollution, but bear with me for an, an analogy here. And, and really think about the relationship here between profit and responsibility. So a very classic dynamic in any kind of free market society is the attempt to privatize profit and socialize cost. And I think this is what we are seeing with information pollution is that there are some entities that demonstrably profit from the way in which our information environment operate today. And I would put to us that we might consider our societies whether with that profit also comes a responsibility to fund the protection of the integrity of that environment against information pollution. So in, 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 in essence, not so much the polluter pays, if you will, because in this case, um, you know, we may not always know in advance who exactly the players are, the actual purveyors of disinformation, but that the companies that produce the technologies that are involved in it are at least in part responsible for also protecting society as a whole against their adverse consequences. Well, thank you very much. That's been extremely interesting. Uh, just to round off, I'd be very interested to ask you, are you mainly optimistic or pessimistic about where things are going to go in the future? Are there any particular changes that you'd like to see or things that you think ought to happen? And uh, what can we look forward to? So I personally am optimistic to an extent uh, because I see that we are having discussions today that we weren't having perhaps five or ten years ago about the role of the web, the role of specific platforms in, ter in, in terms of how information spreads, misinformation, how opinions are formed, uh, how polarization results occur in the real world. So I think there is progress being made, perhaps slowly, but I think people are getting more and more interested in this issue. They are getting more and more concerned about how their data is used, how they're exposed to information online. So I think we're going towards the right direction. The platforms are also trying to take some steps in order to address those concerns, whether that be partnering with fact checkers or trying to present more factual information alongside problematic content and so on. Uh, there is still a long way to go, but I believe people are at the stage where they are broadly aware of the issues and they are trying to work towards a realistic solution to address them. How you think about technology depends on how you think about people. And I'm an optimist. Uh, I would say I'm a conditional optimist. I believe on the balance that we are not as bad as some think we are. And I think on that basis that we have shown that we are just about capable of making technology work to our general benefit. That doesn't mean it's going to be an easy ride. I think we're in some very turbulent and chaotic times, and I think effectively we are seeing now the democratic and political counterpart of something we're used to thinking about in commercial terms, namely creative destruction. And that's what revolutions are like. The old stuff is being destroyed faster than the new stuff is being built. But I would say that um, I'm a conditional optimist that we will find a way of taming this tool, set of tools too and make them work to our advantage. It is a tremendous opportunity, I think. And while we as a society are grappling with the challenges of uh, these technologies, we should also you know, seize the opportunities that they afford to, to democratize access to information, to provide a platform for people across the globe to, to form connected societies. And I think the hope is that we would be able to tame these technologies to, uh, to create perhaps a better and more egalitarian version of what we have today. 
So, I mean, that is my hope, and which is why I think, you know, our work is important. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to Rasmus, Vidya and Mimi for what has been a fascinating journey in this search for the truth. We'd love to know what you think of our Future Makers podcast. So why not leave us a review? And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and let your friends know about the series. In our next episode, we'll be exploring what AI means for the future of humanity itself. I'm Peter Milliken, and you've been listening to Future Makers.